بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله All praises are due to Allah the creator, the cherisher and the sustainer of this universe and may his peace and blessings be upon his noble prophet Muhammad and his descendants and his followers and his companions dear respected brothers and sisters Jazakum Allah khairan for coming actually today inshallah this will be the second session in a course of eight sessions on Surat An-Nur. And the course is called Reflections on Surat An-Nur. Tadabbur Surat An-Nur. It's not Tafsir, because we're not following the principles of Tafsir, but it's about reflecting on Surat An-Nur and trying to decode the messages that are loaded in every verse for us and for our hearts that Allah is putting in these verses to do tarbiyah for us, to discipline uh, the Muslims. Last time, uh, we took some time, actually a long time, in the information about the surah itself and the history of the surah and talking about the theme of the surah. That's why we only discussed three verses. <clears throat> Tonight, inshallah, we have to discuss more in order to finish in eight weeks. Um, tonight, inshallah, we will start by the verse number four, which is وَالَّذِينَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ السَّمِيعِ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءَ فَجْلِدُوهُمْ فَجْلِدُوهُمْ ثَمَانِينَ جَلْدَةً وَلَا تَقْبَلُوا لَهُمْ شَهَادَةً أَبَدًا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ <laughs> Verse number four says, As for those who accuse chaste women of fornication and then fail to provide four witnesses, strike them 80 times and reject their testimony ever afterwards, they are the lawbreakers. The objective from this hukm, from this verdict that deals with slandering chaste people because it doesn't only apply on those who slander chaste women but even those who slander chaste men as well. But the issue is it was mentioned here for women because usually people slander women. Usually people just say that this woman is so and this woman is so. Even sometimes people talk to each other, to their friends, calling him son of a so-and-so or son of a so-and-so, uh, and, and this is nasty. And the objective here is to purify the Muslim society from false accusations, from dirty insults, and to protect the dignity and the honor of individuals. So the objective, look at the objective of this verse. If these verdicts are applied, the society will be a clean society. People will be sitting at home or women will be sitting at home or in their work not worried about themselves being called false accusations. And it says that if someone accuses a woman of fornication, and is unable to bring four witnesses, then he should be lashed 80 lashes on his back. Of course, again, I have to say that this talks about Islamic societies where people apply the Sharia. We are not responsible for applying the Sharia in a non-Muslim country. And I talked before that there are two uh, levels of Sharia. There is the personal level which we are responsible of applying in our lives, in our dealings, in the halal and haram. But when it comes to the penal code or to the uh, what you call the criminal law, we are not responsible for applying the criminal law in a non Muslim country. That's not our responsibility. But we as Muslims have to study the Quran. And here the Quran speaks about criminal law that if the Sharia is applied, in a Muslim society, then anyone who accuses chaste women or chaste people 
with a false accusation that they committed fornication or adultery should be lashed 80 lashes and should be discredited as witness forever. Which means that if he, if he, if he witnesses later on, after being flogged, if he witnesses on a contract, then the contract is disqualified until another, someone else substitutes. He is disqualified as a witness in court, which means he like becomes a second class citizen, not because of his color, not because of his race, not because of his uh, uh, financial uh, level, no, because he's a lawbreaker, because he doesn't respect the law, the law of Allah. And that, that's why he is considered a lawbreaker. Lawbreaker means fasiq. Fasiq is someone who breaks the law of Allah. And get, you need to understand something, that he may be truthful. Maybe he really saw this person fornicating, but because he doesn't have three other witnesses with him, he is considered fasiq, still fasiq. Why? Because he shouldn't talk in this situation. Since he's the only one that he should have covered his Muslim brother or his Muslim sister. Cover. And we will talk a lot today about covering. And the verse also says that he, is, that he can be forgiven if he repents after being lashed. Not necessarily to admit that he lied, because maybe he didn't lie. Maybe he saw something. But he has to, it is enough for him to regret in public and say, I regret, I regret saying these issues. If he regrets in public saying these things, then he can be uh, uh, forgiven. And he has to ask forgiveness from Allah, even if he really saw something. Imam Muslim narrated a hadith, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said, Man satara ala muslimin satarahu Allahu fi dunya wal akhira. That the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, the one who covers a Muslim will be covered by Allah in this life and in the hereafter. So we need to learn to cover. We need to learn to cover people's sins. We need to learn to cover people's faults. We need to learn to cover people's shortcomings. We need to learn to cover people's debts. We need to learn to cover people's needs. Because if you cover people, Allah will cover you. One of the ways people are punished on the Day of Judgment is through scandal. They can be scandal. There are things, most of the things that we do wrong are done privately not in the presence of people, not in the presence of your wife or your spouse or your parents or your children or your uncle. No, not in there. But one of the ways you, people can be punished on the Day of Judgment, may Allah save us from this, is by playing this video, audio and video. Actually not video, but it can be even three-dimensional. A scandal in front of everybody, in front of your wife, in front of your husband, in front of your, uh, yeah, of course I'm talking to the women when I say the husband, okay? Uh, in front of everybody. Scandal. If you cover people in this life, Allah will cover you on the Day of Judgment. Allah will tell you on the Day of Judgment, why did you do this and that? Do you remember when I covered you in this life? When you did this sin? Today I cover you again. If you learn how to cover. The Prophet, peace be upon him, also said another hadith that is mentioned as Sahih in Sahih al Albani. That the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Ya ma'ashara man amana bi lisanihi, wa lam yadkhul al imanu fi qalbihi, la taghtabu al muslimin, wa la tattabi'u awratuhum, fa innahu man ittaba'a awratuhum, awratim, yattabi'u allahu awratahu, wa man yattabi'u allahu awratahu, yadhahuhu fi baytih. O community of people who believed by their tongue and, and believed not 
and, but the belief did not enter their hearts yet. Do not backbite Muslims and do not search for the faults. For if anyone searches for the faults, Allah will search for his fault. And if Allah searches for the fault of anyone, he disgraces him even if he's in his house. So don't keep searching for the faults of people so that Allah can cover you. So this verse, when I reflect upon it, it teaches me not to scandal people, to cover people. Of course, after you cover people, there is also another ritual in Islam called Al-Amr Bil-Ma'ruf wa Nihan Al-Munkar, that you enjoin the good and you forbid the evil. So you need to go and enjoin the good and forbid the evil and advice. And this, is, this has etiquettes. But you don't go and scandal people. You don't disgrace people. The next verse, verse number five, says, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ تَابُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ وَأَصْلَحُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ Except for those who repent later and make amends. God is most forgiving and merciful. The word repent or repentance is mentioned in the Quran 35 times. Telling us that the door of repentance is opened all the time. There's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that says, Inna Allah yabsutu yadahu bil layli liyatuba musi'u nahari. Wa yabsutu yadahu bil nahari liyatuba musi'u layli. Allah stretches his hand by night time for the one who sinned by daytime. And Allah stretches his hand by daytime for the sinner of the night time which means Allah is stretching his hand. It means that Allah is stretching his hand for you to repent 24-7. At any time you can repent, as long as you didn't die yet, as long as your soul did not go out of your body yet, you can repent. And there's another hadith, a famous one. That Allah is more pleased with the repentance of the one of you than a man who lost his ride in a vast desert with all his food and water on it. Then he sat under a tree getting ready to die like that. Then he suddenly finds his ride with the food and the water on it. Which means he finally realized that he survived. He would not die. So out of extreme happiness and because of the shock he says, oh Allah, I am your Lord and you are my servant. And the Prophet said, he got puzzled because of the shock. So here the Prophet is saying that Allah is more pleased with the repentance of one of you than this man is pleased with his survival. This means what? That Allah loves you. Why would Allah be pleased with your repentance except if he loves you? This is something that you should put in mind. Just for being a human being, Allah honored you. The verse says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ We have honored the children of Adam. Just for being a child of Adam, Allah honored you. And Allah loves so much the children of Adam who believe, who believe in him. Verse number six. وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ أَزْوَاجَهُمْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُمْ شُهَدَاءُ إِلَّا أَنفُسُهُمْ فَشَهَادَةُ أَحَدِهِمْ أَرْبَعُ شَهَادَاتٍ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّهُ لَمِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ As for those who accuse their own wives of adultery but have no other witnesses, let each one four times call God to witness that he is telling the truth. And the fifth time, call God to curse him if he is lying. Punishment shall be averted from his wife if she in turn four times calls God to witness that her husband is lying. And the fifth time calls God's wrath to fall on her if he is telling the truth. In this situation, actually one Sahabi came to the Prophet in the mosque and told him, O Prophet of Allah, what if one enters his house 
and finds a man, a stranger, with his wife in bed. If he kills, you kill him. If he speaks, you lash him because he doesn't have three witnesses with him. And it makes no sense to tell a husband to go and bring other people. If he enters and finds something like that, it makes no sense. This one cannot happen. And he says, and if he stays silent, he will explode of anger and depression. The Prophet, what did the Prophet tell him? Nothing. The Prophet doesn't know. The Prophet doesn't speak out of himself. He waits for the answer. And then the Prophet started to make dua. Allahumma iftah. Oh Allah, open a way. Give me the answer. And then the answer came with these verses. That in case a husband accuses his wife of adultery, in this case, he has to witness four times that he is saying the truth. And the fifth, he witnesses that may the curse of Allah, Lana, fall on him if he's a liar. And what waves the punishment from her is that she witnesses four times that he is lying and the fifth she witnesses she says may the anger of Allah fall on her if he is truthful here we need to reflect on this the fifth time he will make dua against himself, the accuser, that may the curse, curse means to be expiated from the mercy of Allah, to be deprived of the mercy of Allah, that may the curse of Allah be on him if he is uh, a liar. But in her case, she will make dua against himself, herself that may the anger of Allah be on her, but not curse herself. What's the difference? Why? Isn't it the same? Both fates are terrible, of course. Either the anger of Allah or the curse. But of course, curse is much worse. Here, because it's true that this will happen if any one of them is lying. But in his case, he is lying to destroy someone. And in her case, if she lies, she is lying to avoid punishment, but not to destroy someone else. So even in the haram, not all the haram is the same. There's a price list. There is haram and super haram, and in, even in the super haram, there is also differences. Things, I'm sorry, please turn off your mobiles. So even this tells us that things are not black and white in this life. There's a big gray scale, but not everything is just black and white. After doing this hukm, which is called al-mula'ana, that they do cursing, which is only in case of accusing one's wife, what happens? They are separated forever. They cannot get married again. Khalas. You know, if someone divorces his wife three times, he can marry her again if she marries someone else. True marriage. And this someone else dies or divorces her, she can again get married again to her first husband. But in this case, they are separated forever. This is something serious. It shouldn't happen if one of them is lying and they cannot live with each other again. But the most important also is that this way he can reject her son. If she is pregnant, he, if he does this mula'ana, he will be uh, able to deny his uh, son as one of his offspring and not say that he's not my, my son. So they are separated forever. Here the question is, what if a woman sees her husband in this situation? Does the same thing happen? No. In her case, 
she can divorce him. You know, women in Islam can divorce. They can dissolve the marriage through something called al-khul'a. Al-khul'a is to return back his dowry and divorce him. Of course, dissolving the marriage is something discouraged in Islam. But at the same time, it is something possible to solve problems. So if a woman sees her husband in this situation, she can do khul'a and dissolve the marriage. But she doesn't need to reject a son. In the case of the man, he needs to reject the son. Because he, ha he will say that maybe the son in her womb or in her, in her, in her, uh, in, in her womb is not his son. So to reach this result, he needs to do the mula'ana, the curse, cursing each other uh, like that. Not cursing each other, but cursing themselves if uh, they are liars. And this is a very wise way actually to, to end an impossible relationship. Because in these situations, we learn about people killing each other and crimes are committed. What also can, is, is very clear here is that there is nothing as so-called honor killing. One of the big misconceptions on Islam is honor killing. That men are allowed to kill women in their family if they fornicate. That's nothing like that. The man entered the mosque and told the Prophet, O Prophet of Allah, what if someone and goes back home and finds a stranger with his wife in bed? If he kills you, kill him. If he speaks, you lash him. And if he stays silent, he will explode of, of anger. So the Prophet said, Oh Allah, give me the answer. And the answer came. So there is nothing a so-called honor killing in Islam. Those people who practice something like that are actually ignorant. There is nothing in Islam a so-called honor killing. But this way of ending, this way of ending the this impossible relationship keeps everyone honor and dignity to continue his life in society. Because if someone accuses his wife with something like that, and she swears four times that he's a liar, and the fifth time that may the anger of Allah be on her if he is truthful, like that she should be looked at in society as a chaste woman. No one should look at her as a, a loose woman. And she can continue her life like that. And then who will be punished? Allah will punish the liar in the hereafter. No one will be punished in this life as long as they continue the five witnesses. The five times witness. Which means that if the man witnesses four times that he is truthful, but when it comes to saying, may the curse of Allah be on him if he's a liar and he couldn't, if he doesn't say it, he will be lashed for accusing. Same thing will happen to her. She will be punished if the fifth time she is unable to say, may the anger of Allah fall on her. But if both of them say it fully, none will be punished in this life and the punishment will be on the, in the hereafter for the uh, liar. And Allah, you see how, how strong the ayahs are. And then Allah sends a very tender and beautiful verse, verse number 10, that says, وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ تَوَّابٌ حَكِيمٌ If it were not for God's bounty and mercy towards you, if it were not that God accepts repentance and is wise, huh, continue. It's an incomplete sentence. You complete it. You complete it. The, the verse says, If it were not for God's bounty and mercy towards you, what does it mean? We would be losers. If it, were, if, if it were not that God accepts repentance and is wise, you continue. Reflect. We would go astray. 
we would be enslaved to our desires and our whims and our... So some of the verses of Allah were sent like that and you continue. For example, the word Allahu Akbar. What does it mean in English? All people, most of those whom I have seen, they translated Allah is great. That's not true. It doesn't mean Allah is great. Some people say, no, Allah is the greatest. No, it doesn't mean that. It means Allah is greater. And every time I meet a translator and I tell him, why did you translate it? Allah is great. It means Allah is greater. And I, I know that you know that. He says, because people will not understand it. It's an incomplete sentence. Yes, of course. And in Arabic too, it's an incomplete sentence. But it is completed with a situation. So in war, we say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater than this enemy. When, I, when we see fire and want to de, uh, extinguish the fire, we say, Allah is greater than this fire. In Salah, we say, Allah is greater than the shaitan. Allah is greater than everything that the shaitan is trying to distract me with. So Allah is greater is an incomplete sentence completed by a situation. This verse is also an incomplete sentence completed by your reflection. Here you need to reflect. And then the verses start. Verses number 11 talking about the slander. The slander is an incident that happened in the Sirah at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and it was considered the biggest earthquake that ever shaked the Muslim society. Hypocrites slandered Lady Aisha herself. The head of the hypocrites launched a rumor against Lady Aisha herself that she committed adultery with one of the great Sahaba. And it was a very terrible situation. Jibril did not descend on the Prophet for about a month. Lady Aisha didn't know what happened. Actually, Lady Aisha uh, narrates the, uh, the incident by saying that the Prophet, peace be upon him, used to um, draw the, uh, it's like toss, actually, or draw the, the uh, Qur'an, what's this? To choose someone randomly, he used to choose one of his wives randomly every time he travels. And one of the, in one of his travels, uh, it was uh, her. So she went with him, and they used to sit in a howdaj. Howdaj is something that is put on the camel so that the women do not appear from outside. It's like a, like a, a covered tent over the camel. And she said, I was still... Uh, thin, I didn't gain weight yet. So I lost, when the army was about to move, I found that I lost one of my necklaces. It was cut. So I went looking for it. When I came back, I found that the army moved and the people who uh, carried the howdaj over the camel did not realize that I'm not inside because maybe it was, I wasn't heavy enough. And the army moved. Lady Aisha was a very smart woman. She said, if I try to follow the army, I may get lost in this desert. I would just stay where, I'm at, where I am until they realize that I'm not on the camel and someone comes back to uh, pick me up. So she stayed where she is. Usually armies at these days used to uh, leave someone behind them to... Uh, to uh, watch and see if some people or some uh, armies are, are coming or, or are going to attack from behind. So there was this Sahabi, trying to remember his name, Safwan ibn al-Mu'attal, right? So Safwan was there and he was uh, walking behind the army. So he saw Lady Aisha. She said he's an uh, old uh, Sahabi uh, so he saw me before the uh, veil was uh, obligated on the women of the Prophet. 
he said, so when he saw me, he said, لا حول ولا قوة إلا إن لله وإن إليه راجعون ضعينة رسول الله the wife of the prophet so he took his camel down he allowed her to go on the camel and he started walking she said he did not even talk to me I only kept hearing him saying his adhkar and his لا إله إلا الله لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله and I'm on his camel and then when they reached the army the army was already about to rest and the head of the hypocrites, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, saw them. He said, huh, the wife of your prophet spent the night with one of them, one of the, one of the Muslims. By Allah, uh, something must have happened between them. And then the rumors started to uh, circulate. And she didn't know anything about it. Until one woman was visiting her one day and they went out to the area outside Medina where people used to go and make a toilet because they didn't have toilets in their houses yet. And that woman uh, stumbled and fell and then she said, May Allah curse Mistah, Mistah her son. And Mistah was one of the people who were actually repeating the rumor. He wasn't a hypocrite, but he was just repeating. He says, I heard someone saying so-and-so. I heard. He didn't say that she did anything, but he said, I heard people saying so-and-so about Aisha. So when, he, when she stumbled and fell and she cursed her son, she told her, how come you curse a companion of the Prophet? How come you curse someone who participated in Bedr? She looked at her and said, you little girl, you don't know what's happening? You don't know what is circulating about you? You don't know what Mustah is participating in? She said, no, tell me what happened. So she told her. You know, women sometimes like to talk. I, I, felt, I feel like this woman really wanted to tell Aisha. She didn't like that Aisha doesn't know what's happening. So she wanted to tell her. She, she told her. Aisha fell. She said, I fell ill because of that. When the Prophet came back home, I understood why he was different. Since some time he's different with me and I don't know why, now I can understand. And I told him, please allow me to go uh, to my uh, parents' house. I want to stay there. He said, okay, you can go. She said, I wanted to meet my mother and speak to her about what's happening. There she went and the Prophet came visiting her in her parents' house. She said, he entered and he said, how is that girl? And then he sat on the side of the bed with my bed and he told me Aisha look if you did something wrong if you sinned ask forgiveness from Allah he will forgive you but if you're innocent put your trust in him that he will prove your innocence I want you just to imagine how loving and tender the prophet was if any man is in this situation god forbids at least he will like shake his wife from the shoulder and tell her i want to know the truth but the prophet didn't say so i said he said if you sinned if you really sinned ask forgiveness from allah he will forgive you but if not put your trust in him he will reveal your innocence aisha says i looked at my parents, they, uh, they, they uh, disciplined me and they know me. So I told my mom, mom, answer the Prophet of Allah, expecting that her mom will defend her. But because for about a month, the rumors were circulating, people are talking. Her mom said, I don't know what to say to the Prophet. Aisha was shocked. She said, I looked at my dad and I said, dad, Answer the Prophet of Allah. Her dad also said, I don't know what to tell the Prophet. She said, so I looked at the three of them. And I said, listen, I know that you, are, you kept hearing this about me over and over and over until you believe it deep inside of you. So if I tell you that I'm innocent, you will not believe me. And she says to herself, and God knows I'm innocent. 
And if I tell you that I sinned, you will believe me. So actually I don't find anything more fitting for me to tell you except the very words of the father of Joseph. She even forgot the name Jacob. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانُ عَلَى مَا تَصِفُونَ Beautiful patience is what is more fitting for me, which means patience without complaining to anyone except to Allah is what's more fitting for me. And I seek refuge with Allah from what you think about me. And I gave them my back and I turned my back in my bed to them and I kept crying until I felt that my liver will be torn apart. But I was sure, I, I, I trusted Allah that he will prove my innocence. But I never expected that he would descend verses in the Quran to be read until the last day on earth, proving my innocence. All I wished is that the Prophet sees a vision in his sleep. And Allah here, in verse number 11, descended the uh, innocence of Lady Aisha, proclaiming the innocence of Lady Aisha. The verse says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لا تحسبوه شرا لكم بل هو خير لكم لكل امرئ منهم ما اكتسب من الاثم والذي تولى كبره منهم له عذاب عظيم it was a group from among you that concocted the lie do not consider it a bad thing for you it was a good thing and every one of them will be charged with the sin he has earned. He who took the greatest part in it will have a painful punishment. Talking about the head of the hypocrites, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. The verse next says, لَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ ظَنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتُ بِأَنفُسِهِمْ خَيْرًا وَقَالُوا هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينٌ when you heard the lie, why did believing men and women not think well of themselves and declare this is ob obviously a lie? لَوْلَا جَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُهَدَاءِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ And why did the accusers not bring four witnesses to it? If they cannot produce such witnesses, they are the liars in God's eyes. We will reflect on these verses later, but let me say them all now. وَلَوْلَا فَضْلُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَتُهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ لَمَسَّكُمْ فِي مَا أَفَضْتُمْ فِيهِ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ If it were not for God's bounty and mercy towards you in this world and the next, you would already have been afflicted by terrible suffering for indulging in such talk. إِذْ تَلَقَّوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٌ وَتَحْسِبُونَهُ هَيِّنَهُ وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ When you took it up with your tongues and spoke with your mouth things you did not know to be true. You thought it was trivial, but to God it was very serious. وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنْ نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ When you heard the lie, why did, not, why did you not say we should not repeat this? God forbid, it's a monstrous slander. Let's start to reflect on the verse number 11. It was a group from among you that concocted the lie, do not consider it a bad thing for you, it was a good thing. Excuse me, what is good? What is good in accusing one of the mothers of the believers of adultery? That's very serious actually. But what is good here? So that we can learn maybe, yeah, but that was a very big price. What else? Who can give me Another answer. Separates who? Good people from bad people. Exposing the monafics. This is the gift for you, Akhi. This is the last film, okay? Islam and women. Yeah. We just launched it two days ago. Exactly. Exposing the hypocrites. 
is a very good thing, no matter the price is. No matter how the price is too high. No matter if it's a slander or a military coup or anything or people dying in the streets, just exposing the hypocrites is good. So don't hate so much such situations because still there, is, there can be good in these situations for the Muslim Ummah. I believe deeply that the conquest of Mecca started in Uhud. Because it's not fitting for the army that conquers Mecca to have Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul and the Munafiqs in it. So Uhud was a very big price. In Uhud, 70 Muslims uh, were martyred, which means 10% of the army died. That's a big price, but it's okay if this will just expose the Munafiqs in the Ummah. This is good. The separation, as the brother said. So this is, one, this is my reflection on this. And when I see the situation in the Muslim world today and the conspiracy against the uh, uh, Arab Spring, I say there is some good in this. Munafiqs were exposed. That's why we need to talk about good and bad. What is good and what is bad? Ibn al-Arabi, the great Imam of the Malikiyah in Andalus said, good is what benefits more than, it, than, than, than harms. So if there are some benefits more than the harm, then the situation is good. And bad is what its harm is more than its benefits. If you have 51% benefit, then it's good. Even if there's a price. And of course here, when I see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّى كِبَرَهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Every one of them will be charged with the sin he, was, he has earned, and he who took the greatest part in it will have a painful punishment. This talks about the distribution of uh, the reward and the distribution of punishment too. Because actually, in Islam, the one who starts a good tradition and people start uh, imitating him, he will be rewarded for everyone who is doing like him. At the same time, if someone starts a bad tradition and people start imitating him, they will be punished and he will be punished also for every one of them. So here actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the one who started this, who launched the rumor, will have the biggest punishment. He is a Abdullah ibn Abib Nasiru. But guess what happened? Actually, in this, there are different narrations. A narration that says, that says that those people were punished and lashed, 80 lashes, for slandering Lady Aisha. Among those was Mistah, the companion that Abu Bakr, uh, that, that actually the son of the lady who told her. And among them was Hassan ibn Thabit, the poet of the Prophet, because he also contributed to uh, spreading the rumor, okay, and the head of the hypocrites. But the stronger narration, the more authentic one, says no one was lashed and no one was punished. You know why? Because Lady Aisha forgave them all. She forgave them all. After all this, actually, I believe any wise woman in her situation will do the same. This, now she, her innocence was revealed in the Quran. It is read <laughs> until the, yani in the Quran, it descended from above seven firmaments. And it is read until the last day. Her happiness with this made her forgive them all. She forgave them all, mashallah. Verse number 12 says, لولا إذ سمعتموه ظن المؤمنون والمؤمنات بأنفسهم خيرا وقالوا هذا إفكم مبين When you heard the lie, why did the believing men and women not think well of themselves and declare this is obviously a lie? This is, there is something strange in the wording. 
it is expected to say لولا إذ سمعتموه ظن المؤمنون والمؤمنات ببعضهم بعضا خيرا not بأنفسهم it is expected to say when you heard the lie why did believing men and women not think well of each other but it says of themselves subhanallah it's as if you're, it's telling you you and your brother and your sister are one if it hurts them it hurts you why didn't you think well about yourself which means about your brother what hurts your brother hurts you it is a way to it's called ta'tif al-muslimin ala ba'dhum it means to bring to make the muslims feel empathy towards each other to sympathize with each other the question here ask yourself do you really feel, feel the pain of others or you just live for yourself do you feel the pain of others in this ummah what befells your brother and sister befells you how many i'm not going to talk about the the muslim world i'm going to talk about here our london world how many sisters in this community are jobless and single mothers are on benefits or even their benefits were cut what are we doing for them there's so many cases what are we doing did we try to work collectively to take care of these women i'm speaking about single moms who were on benefits and because the child became five there's no more benefits like before they can't even pay the rent or what did we do collectively for them these are things that i have to reflect here when i read why didn't the believers men and women think well about themselves because yeah what happens to my to this sister is happening to me at the same time uh, because actually we all have the iman in common makes us one body that's how the prophet peace be upon him described the muslim ummah he said the example of the believers is like a one body if an organ is in pain the rest of the organs show solidarity by sharing the fever and the sleeplessness if you have a, a, a pain in your feet or somewhere well all the organs show solidarity with this organ by fever and sleeplessness this is our example are we truly like that or are we just individuals laula إذ سمعتموه ظن المؤمنون لولا is a word in Arabic or actually it's it there is a, a reprimand to the believers all the believers here except one man and his wife Abu Ayyub al-Ansari you know what Abu Ayyub al-Ansari did when they heard the rumor he talked to his wife and he told her who is better you or aisha she said aisha is better than me definitely she said and who is better me or safwan she said no safwan is better than you because why do they think that because a muslim should be humble humble not meaning faked humbleness that we see around us no to be humble it means that you really see yourself small insignificant not better than others so when they thought to each other aisha is better than his wife and he is less than safwan and he told her if you are in aisha's situation would you commit adultery she said definitely not and she told him if you are where in safwan's position will you commit adultery he said definitely not they said since we do not commit that sin and they both are better than us then definitely they did not commit the sin and before any innocence of lady aisha was sent down from from heaven both of them thought like that about the two accused innocent people and they said definitely that they are innocent and here this verse is actually reprimanding all the muslims except them 
Why didn't you do like them? Saying, when you heard the lie, why did believing men and women not think well of themselves and declare this is obviously a lie? Some people did not spread the rumor. Some people did not speak, but at the, at, at, at the end, they did not speak and say that's obviously a lie. You should say it's a lie. When someone talks about someone else without witnesses, without proof, you say it's a lie. Stop him. Stop him. This can bring a clean society. Abu Ayyub, of course, is known in the seerah. He's the one who hosted the Prophet وسلم, when he came to Medina for seven months. And he insisted that the Prophet وسلم, stays in the uh, upper story. It's better and co more comfortable for him. But of course, the Prophet had a lot of guests coming to visit him. So it was very s difficult to, for them to go upstairs. And Abu Ayyub and his wife are staying in the ground floor. So the Prophet insisted to stay in the ground floor. So the Prophet went down and he stayed the rest of the uh, time in the, in the ground floor. And one day, some water were, or some milk were uh, spilled. So because him and his wife were afraid that it drops on, from the ceiling on the Prophet, so with their only uh, cover that they used to cover when they sleep at night, they kept like drying the floor so that the Prophet doesn't suffer from anything dripping on him or anything. He used to love him so much. Those people love the Prophet so much. Abu Ayyub, by the way, is, is uh, buried in Istanbul. By the way, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave the last sermon, Khutbat al Wada'a, to 113,000 companions. Only 10,000 of them are buried in Mecca and Medina. And the rest, all over the world, spreading Islam. So this verse teaches us the etiquettes of talking and the etiquettes of listening. About talking, it teaches us that no one should talk of something he is ignorant of. You cannot speak, you cannot just continue saying what you just heard. Just spreading things that you don't, that you don't have, that you're ignorant of, that you, you, you don't have knowledge about. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, it means one lies, one lies when he talks about everything he hears. If you just hear someone saying something and you go and you, you just repeat it again, you will definitely fall into telling a lie. Because maybe he's lying. I can have some water. I can have some water. So. The second thing is, no one should talk with anything that hurts others. Muslims should be very sensitive to these issues. Don't hurt others. Make your words bring happiness to people, not sadness, not distress. And the etiquette of listening, no one should listen to falsehood, no one should listen to lies, no one should listen to backbiting. It's not telling you not to backbite, no. This goes without saying. It tells you not to listen to backbiting. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, المغتاب والمستمع شريكان في الإثم Which means, the backbiter and the listener are both partners in the punishment on the day of judgment. You cannot listen even when someone just speaks ill about people, don't listen to him. And in the next verses, you will see you ha even have to stop him. Stop him. Like that, we are discouraging backbiters from continuing such attitude. But when they find people listening, they continue backbiting. And they continue slandering. So therefore, you are not allowed to listen, let alone talking. I want you to imagine how clean the society can be if we do that. Rumors cannot spread if this is our behavior. Verse number 13 says, لَوْ لَا جَاءُوا عَلَيْهِ بِأَرْبَعَةِ شُهَدَاءِ فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُهَدَاءِ فَأُولَئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ And why did the accusers not bring four witnesses to it? If they cannot produce such witnesses, they are the liars in God's eyes. Reflecting upon this verse, if they do not bring four witnesses, and they are liars, even if they really saw the sex out of marriage 
happening. Therefore, a Muslim should cover his fellow Muslim, not scandal him. And of course, later, he can advise and enjoy the good and forbid the evil. But not go and say, I saw this man fornicating. I saw this man going to the bar. I saw this man going to the club. You cannot do that. Advise him. Give him da'wah. But don't disgrace him. Verse number 14, and I will end with this verse tonight. ولولا فضل الله عليكم ورحمته في الدنيا والآخرة لمسكم فيما أفضتم فيه عذاب عظيم If it were not for God's bounty and mercy towards you in this world and the next you would already have been afflicted by terrible suffering for indulging in such talk Subhanallah, after all this you find a verse loaded with messages of mercy telling you Allah is merciful in spite of the seriousness of the sin. Slandering people, still Allah is merciful. If you fall in backbiting, Allah is merciful. Just ask, ask forgiveness. Repent. If you fall in slandering someone, innocent person, still Allah is merciful. Do not despair of Allah's mercy. No sin is small with insisting on it and no sin is big or great or major with seeking forgiveness from it you need to know it because some people think well some sins are just very small it's just a cigarette yeah yeah but you're insisting don't tell me it's a very trivial thing with insisting nothing is trivial nothing is small if you keep insisting in one box of cigarette if one cigarette is Makro, unrecommended. 20 unrecommended will not make one haram. <laughs> so with insisting, nothing is small. No sin is small. At the same time, with asking forgiveness, nothing is major sin. Every major sin, Allah will, will accept your repentance. Just repent for him. Repent to him. And here there is a condition in this verse. It says, if it were not for God's bounty and mercy towards you in this world and the next, you would already have been afflicted by terrible suffering. The word lawla, harf imtina'al wujud, which means it is a pronoun that exists. Or actually, th this, this word, when, when you find it, it means that there is something that will not exist for the existence of something else. Here in this verse it says, if it were not for God's bounty and mercy, which means because of God's bounty and mercy towards us, huh, you would already have been afflicted by terrible suffering. The terrible suffering will not exist, which means because of God's mercy, God's mercy will save us from this terrible punishment. No matter what the sin is. No matter what the sin is. Next. Time, inshallah, we will start by إِذْ تَلَقَّوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَتَقُولُونَ بِأَفْوَاهِكُمْ مَا لَيْسَ لَكُمْ بِهِ عِلْمٌ وَتَحْسَبُونَهُ هَيِّنًا وَهُوَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ عَظِيمٌ When you received it with your tongues and spoke with your mouth, things you did not know to be true. You thought it was trivial, but to God it was very serious. I want you to reflect upon this verse, which talks about when you received it with your tongues. Do people receive with their tongues? or with their ears. Next time we will discuss it inshallah.